What's going on guys? Welcome back to finally Victoria 2. It's been two or three weeks since the last episode and I'm terribly sorry that it took so long but there's a really really good reason for why. I've actually already mentioned this in various comments here and there but I'm just gonna say it for everyone who's watching this series. I I had to redo the peace treaty. First of all the peace treaty uh, is quite enormous and it took a very long time for me to come up with it and implement it into the game and that was when I was almost done the first time around, the save would somehow corrupt. Uh, and whenever I would start the game and the save, it would crash immediately. So I had to redo the treaty. And uh, that obviously took a long time in its in its own or on its own. But I was also quite frustrated and demotivated the first time after it crashed the first time. So I didn't start uh, redoing the treaty immediately. And that obviously prolonged um, the, the wait as well. But I've finally done it, no crashes, and I'm very happy and proud to present you the peace treaty of this first world war. Although, I guess you could argue it's the second great war, but it's truly the first world war. Uh, regardless, um, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to be showing you uh, screenshots before and after of each region that has been affected. I'll just show them in a few seconds, and then uh, I'm just simply going to read out the list of the things that have changed. So the screenshots are coming up now. Okay guys, so uh, those are the screenshots. Um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read out the list of all the changes. Now please keep in mind that I do not include uh, the things that we have enforced through the war itself, right? So for example, when the United Baltic Provinces gained some lands over here, that was during the actual peace deal in the game. That is something I'm not gonna bring up again. Uh, only the things that I've personally changed. So, uh, we're going to start off with probably the easiest thing to explain. We're going to start off with uh, South America. Basically, the Inca gain all of the British inland colonies. So, the Brits, as you can see, they have a lot of cores. This is all they had to give up. The Inca gained, uh, during the peace deal, they gained the German lands. And I think there was one province left. I gave that to them as well. And then they gained all of the British in inland uh, colonies. Uh, inland only because, well... They did occupy them, but we saw how powerful the British Navy is. So I feel like we should at least give them the coast. As I said, uh, the Brits were able to defend their homeland and therefore we cannot punish them as much in this peace deal. So they will have to give up a few things, but not everything. And therefore they get to keep the coast. I think that makes quite a lot of sense. And that is basically it. That is it. Uh, for South America. I have removed all the German cores, not only in South America, but um, over here, obviously, as well. Just wanted to mention that. That's all we have to talk about here, and we can move on to the next. I'm actually now going to talk about France, because France was not actually involved in the war, but they still get to participate in the peace treaty for several reasons. First of all, they're a great power, and so they always, you know, kind of have a say in what's going on. And also, France is an absolute monarchy. And this is kind of important to us as well, because, well, we've seen the insurgences of fascists, of communists, and just democracies all over the place. And so having a great power, an absolute great power monarchy, um, is useful, and we should strengthen them uh, somewhat. Or at least we should be on relatively good terms with them. So basically what I've done is I've punished the United Kingdom, once again, by giving up their um, holdings on the continent because as I said they can't really hold them right um, so they had to give up their lands in Iberia which was like five provinces and instead of releasing them or taking them myself I've decided to give them to France uh, to France because well we want to stay on good terms with them but also because this should be this this doesn't work in Victoria 2 but in Hearts of Iron 4 I want this to be a demilitarized zone North Iberia here um, is going to be a, new, a demilitarized zone. This was a suggestion from uh, some of you in the comment section. A few people have actually suggested setting up a demilitarized zone. Most of those suggestions were for like Germany, which I don't think makes all that much sense. But this one I feel like makes a lot of sense because the French are, the capital is somewhere here in, yeah, Fort St. John. 
their capital is in North America. They have no real business in Europe anymore. Uh, they might want to come back, but at the moment, they don't really have any strength. And so I feel like, okay, I've given them land, so they feel good about it. They can use it. They can use the economy there, but they cannot have any troops there. Um, I feel like that, that would make sense. I mean, they should agree because they get free land. And for us, it's good because our... Our border to the south is at least somewhat protected and we've kicked out the Brits and that is important. Um, so yeah, that's what's happened and, and I'm really looking forward to a demilitarized zone there and what France can do with it in Hearts of Iron 4. Uh, also, um, I have given the Castilian colonies, I just want to mention this right here, basically Castile has been almost completely dismantled and their colonial empire has been destroyed basically. There's a few things they get to retain, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but for example, all of the Castilian South Africa has been given over to French Africa. I could have taken it myself, but it would have looked really terrible, and I was also somewhat going for good borders here. Not always, but whenever I could make the borders look a little bit nicer, I was going to do that as well. So, uh, as you can see, I have not given out of uh, Holland's colony here but I did give these lands to to France I think it looks really nice and it is a great compensation because France is doing something for us as well and um, because they are renouncing they have renounced quite a few claims now they had a lot of claims here in Africa and they have renounced all of them they still claim Sicily and southern Italy and obviously all of France but they no longer claim this so I think that is a great step forward uh, also, uh, one thing I should mention that uh, the Castilian colonies here in this area, they had like, I think, eight provinces. They were distributed as follows. Two of them were given to France. Then you can see four were given to me and two were given to Mali. And I'll talk about why that is uh, in a second as well. Uh, also, and that is just a minor thing. France also had two cores, I think, in Avila and Madrid or some of these provinces, I got rid of them as well because this is supposed to be a demilitarized zone. France is not supposed to set foot uh, into Europe, at least not with forces. That's uh, armed forces, of course. That is my idea. But yeah, that was France. Uh, Portugal, as you can see, has been released. Uh, Portugal is an absolute monarchy. I made sure of that. That was also a suggestion from people in the comment section. They have Portuguese as their primary culture. And as I said, they're an absolute monarchy. And... Yeah, they are, if we have a quick look, they don't have any cores outside of their ter territory. In fact, they actually don't actually have cores here. But um, I, give, I gave them these lands because the majority of people here is Portuguese. So I felt like it makes sense to give these lands to Portugal. Um, now, down here, the majority is actually Spanish, but Portugal did have a core. So that's why they get the entire coast. Um, yeah, that's Portugal, but they are independent, they're not in the sphere of anyone, but they want to have an alliance with us. Uh, one thing I should mention, Castile gave up a lot of cores, basically they renounced everything in Africa except for the, prote the Protectorate Air, um, but they have not given up their cores on Portugal, so that could be a potential war, and Portugal is immediately asking for an alliance, and I think we'll accept that one right now just to keep the peace and i def i definitely think we're actually going to work on getting portugal in our sphere of influence as well just because it would make sense okay now we've already talked about mali a little bit mali has gained these two provinces here from castile it's not really a big deal but still it's nice for them and um i am also going to help them out in their current war I will give them war subsidies. Uh, that is actually quite a lot of money each day to help this nation. But we're going we're gonna to go ahead and do that because they're fighting the Brits. Um, so we're going to help them out. But in return for these provinces I've given to them, they also had to give up a few things. They had to renounce their claims. Uh, they had, I think, claims on these two provinces. And they also basically gave up occupation of the British-controlled territories. Now, the Brits had... Uh, I think like four, like one, two, three, four provinces here colonized. And I have now taken them over. The Brits had to give them up as well. Uh, they were taken over by Mali. And so I said, okay, the Brits no longer control them. So I made a, my, I make a deal with Mali that they give up control, give these lands over to me, and in return they get other lands and support in their current war with Britain. So if Mali is successful here, they could really gain a lot of strength here in the south. Um, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, that was just something that I felt makes sense as well. 
Now, Castile, I've already talked about, and let's see if there's anything I've missed. Castile had to renounce their claims on Africa, the Canaries, and also Brittany. Uh, for a long time, they had claims on Brittany. I've removed them now as well. Uh, they do keep Air as a protectorate, but Air had to actually cede provinces to us as well. Um, we... Yeah, basically these three provinces, it looked really, really terrible. And therefore I decided to take them over as well. Makes the borders look much nicer. They're not really worth much, these provinces. Um, there's like 50 people here. But yeah, there's like 9,000 people. Uh, but I feel like, you know, it really looks a lot better. So uh, why not go for that as well? Um, and yeah, Castile has now also been changed back to an absolute monarchy. They do have the conservative faction in power. We'll see if they're going to be able to do it. I, I could imagine that we have a branch of a dynasty on their throne. Um, but I think that will be... I will let you guys decide that. You make up really great stories. So you, you decide who's on the throne of Portugal and Castile. Uh, that's for you guys to decide. Okay, um, yeah, the United Kingdom, I already talked about them as well. They gave up their colonies in South Africa, at least their inland colonies. They gave up uh, their lands here in, in North Africa. They couldn't hold on to them anyways. Even Mali was able to take them, so I feel like that makes sense. Uh, also, the Brits have to give up their lands in Iberia to France, and they have renounced their claims on southern France. Uh, they had a lot of cores here. I have said that they renounced them as well. But other than that, they get to do... Yeah, they just get to stay there. Uh, they still have yeah, a few colonies. I don't think they have any other colonies, to be honest. But they have their sphere. I mean, it's not much, but they have their sphere. And they have their islands still intact. Yeah, other than that, uh, Brunswick, one of the one of the people siding with us in this conflict, I have uh, obviously given them some land in the peace deal, but I've also decided to give them the province of Dortmund as well as Maastricht, simply because these two, once again, looked hideous, and it makes sense to give them to them. And they also gained three provinces here, Berlin, Cottbus, and uh, Prenzlau from uh, Holstein. Just because it also, it looks much better and I feel like Holstein, you know, they, they, they're they not protected by any great power. They were not involved in the war, but I don't see why, you know, I mean, they could try and fight, but they would just lose anyway. So, therefore, I feel like they would have accepted such a peace deal. Uh, I should mention that Holstein also gained a province. They gained a province back that was, uh, you know, taken by rebels and given to Germany. Uh, so, they get something. Anyway, uh, moving on, uh, we have Rostov. Now, Rostov, this is a very important country because obviously this whole war started over Krakow. Over Krakow and the Polish citizens within. As you can see, uh, Krakow is now free. Uh, that was suggested by a lot of you people, and I've really been con contemplating if I should do this. But in the end, I decided, all right, fine. But here is what we've done. Um, it's an absolute monarchy. So once again, you guys can, up with, can come up with who's going to rule it. And it's also a satellite state of Rostov. So Rostov had to give them some autonomy. And as you can see, even though their primary culture is still Russian, they now accept Polish. They also accept Mongol since that is accepted in, uh, in Rostov itself. Um, but you can see that Polish is now an added an accepted culture. So basically, Krakow and the Polish minority, uh, you know, one million minority, by the way, uh, still gets to get some of their rights, which is good. So, you know, they are not lo no longer just a non-accepted uh, culture. They are somewhat independent. And, well, Polish is accepted, at least in these three provinces. And I've basically not only freed Krakow, but I've also freed Tarnov and Novi Such or whatever, uh, because it has majority Polish population. Um, so, there you go. So, Rostov didn't technically lose much control, but obviously a little bit of autonomy and a few concessions they had to make to Krakow. Now, uh, also, one thing that I should simply mention is I, I've given 50 prestige to Rostov, and basically I say that I have raised them from a Grand Duchy to a Tsardom. So they are basically now a kingdom tier country, no longer a Grand Duke, but a, a Tsar. Uh, and I feel like that makes sense as well because they fought well. And I kind of, you know, yeah, I, I guess they had to give up a little bit of power and therefore that is their compensation. Um, yeah, Krakow, as I said, yeah, we've already talked about them. Now, Poland, um, they, were, they didn't have to give up any lands. They're still in our sphere. 
and I think they have to pay war operations or something like that, and they had to renounce their claims. So basically, they have no more claims outside, or they have no more claims on Krakow, which I feel like is very important. So yeah, they cannot demand this anymore. Not really a big deal. I mean, I want to have them as my friends. They have helped us various times, so I don't, didn't want to be too harsh to Poland. Um, then, uh, Liege, another one of the great powers that has sided against us, and Liege has been made an absolute monarchy as well, and of course they had to give up a few provinces to Brunswick. Uh, other than that, they had to renounce some lands from Brunswick, they had to, yeah, they had to give up a few cores in Brunswick, but not all of them, and to had, they had to give up the uh, claims to Elsa's Lorraine and Charlwell as well, uh, just because they, they should no longer claim that land as theirs. And yeah, let's quickly check out their monarchies here. So they have the conservative party in power, but they still got, I mean, they got close to 4 million population. I mean, they look very tiny, but they are powerful. They are certainly powerful. Yeah, other than that, I've released a new nation, Bohemia Moravia. Oh, once again, I mean, yeah. Uh, Liege is now a monarchy and Bohemia Moravia is also a monarchy. So once again, you guys can come up with who rules these nations. Uh, Bohemia, Moravia is also independent. They're not in our sphere. They're not our puppet. Uh, there are, as I said, absolute monarchy with the royal conservative faction. Two million people. Czech is the only accepted, as uh, the primary culture and the only accepted culture. But if we have a quick look here, you can see that most of the inhabitants here are actually Germans. Um, so that, you know, might be problematic for them. Uh, but we shall see. Uh, we shall see if they handle this properly. Um, other than that, yeah, we've got Bavaria. Uh, I've mentioned this earlier, but I've eliminated all traces of Germany. There's no more German cores, and there's also obviously no Germany. And yeah, from basically the German heartlands, we've, we've ripped a few countries, but I've also decided to release Bavaria once again. Uh, there's a little bit of border goal going on here, but I feel like this is very historical, so I didn't want to destroy that. There was no reason to you know, change that. So it's a little bit of border goal going on there, but it's not too bad. And basically Bavaria has, well, modern day Bavaria as well as uh, parts of uh, Baden and Württemberg right there. And they are also an absolute monarchy and have the conservative faction in power. Five million men still, so they're still likely to come back as a great power um, if their economy uh, ever, uh, well, recovers from this okay and um, then we need to talk about a big one here uh, but I, before we do that i want to talk about novgorod here now novgorod just like rostov i've made into a sardom basically i've given them 50 prestige just because they had to give up a few provinces because the german lands as well as denmark helsingland which was in a sphere and a few lands held by novgorod have all been uh well put together into a new country. Now this country, I wanted to name Fennoscandia because it's basically a fascist Scandinavia, but I couldn't rename the country. So it's just Scandinavia. This is the flag uh, that it has. So basically the, this Norse uh, eagle or whatever it is, uh, which is kind of cool. They are a fascist dictatorship with the, uh, you know, fascist party in power and they are a satellite state of the Roman Empire. So we've basically grown stronger in this area as well and we've split them. Uh, their culture, by the way, is Greek because if you remember, our fascist faction is known as the Varangian God. And basically what I've decided we're gonna do is we're gonna disband the Varangian God, if I can find them. Um, perhaps I've already done that. Have I? No, there is the Varangian God. So they have, they obviously have been fighting here quite a lot. We're going to disband them. There's going to be no longer a Varangian God. We will only have the Praetorians from now on because we basically exiled them into Scandinavia. They get to rule this country on their own. And that actually have, that has, well, some more um, significance uh, for our politics as well. As you can see, we can enact a following reform because basically I decided to kick out a lot of the fascists, like half of the fascists we had in the upper house have been kicked out, as well as a few socialists, communists. We basically just cleared our uh, upper house uh, of that, which here's the thing, like the upper house still doesn't make sense. I know that, you know, there's a Senate and whatnot, but we're still an absolute monarchy. I keep saying this, but it's like, this is a major flaw of Victoria. The upper house doesn't make sense if you're an absolute monarchy. Anyway, 
So I just wanted to say this. We kicked out a lot of the fascists and we put them into Scandinavia. They get to rule their own country. This was also suggested, uh, by the way, by one of my uh, supporters on Patreon, uh, OverG. So um, I kind of tried to get the, th yeah, get his suggestion um, to fit into our uh, well, story, and I feel like this makes sense. Um, so we disbanded the Varangian God, we can no longer build them, and they have now returned to their homelands in Scandinavia. Yeah, anything else I have missed? I don't think so. So yeah, that is that. Is that. And yeah, Novgorod obviously had to give up a few lands here that they controlled previously, uh, but for that they have been uh, compensated with being raised from a Grand Duchy to a Tsardom, which I feel like is fine. Okay, so I've disbanded the Ranging God. I have given war subsidies to Mali. And um, now there's only one thing really left to do. And that is to enact a reform. Now, during the war, we have seen huge uprisings. Multiple uprisings. And we've seen them before the war. And we're going to see them after the war as well. But I feel like even our conservative government um, needs to act somehow. So, um, I've been looking at the movements. The highest or the biggest movement is apparently the yes the ab abolitionist movement four million people are supporting this but those are four million radical people right and if we have a quick look at our population the roman empire in general you can see the dominant issue is outlawing slavery it's only 12 percent, which doesn't seem like much but there's there's 12 percent of our population um whose dominant issue is slavery. That doesn't mean that like the other people don't want to get rid of slavery. It simply means that, that for those people, this is the most important thing in their fucking life, basically. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use the, uh, we're going to use this opportunity where we have rearranged our upper house. We've kicked out the fascists and the socialists and communists. And basically we have strengthened our conservative reactionary somewhat and liberal faction. And we can now go ahead and outlaw slavery as a reaction to the many uprisings we've had. And that should lower our um, militancy as well. At least I hope so. So let's go for it. Uh, slavery has now been and act it uh, has been outlawed yes there you go i think this is a big step in the right direction and uh yeah there we freaking go that was basically all that has happened now one thing i definitely got to do is make you a priority because i want to get you into my sphere and i think we're gonna get krakow into a sphere as well okay yeah i know that was that was quite a long talk. Um, I do want to go forward a little bit, though. I don't know how I think about getting Ojibwe as an ally, to be honest. I, I feel like they're going to be a great power. They have a communist party. Ooh, we have a, we're going to have a communist great power, guys. I know a lot of people have been wanting this, including me, actually, because otherwise it would be a bit stale. Um, but if we have a quick look at the situation right now, we have Rome, obviously the greatest power in the world. Our allies, the Inca, our greatest power, our second greatest power in the world. Then, the ones that sided with us in the war, Brunswick, strongest, um, well, German power, uh, and fascist. Then, we've got the United Kingdom, who, despite losing the war, is still place four in the great power rank. So, you know, good for them. Their navy saved their, their ass, basically. The French, on rank number five, uh, as an absolute monarchy, we definitely want to uh, strengthen our ties. But, yeah, they don't like us still, because we, obviously, still control France, their heartlands, and they will never give them up. Then the Blackfoot, sort of a wild card socialists. So there's a lot of socialism and communism going on in the New World. So that's another reason we need to strengthen the French because they're upholding the values of the absolute monarchy. Then Liège uh, was a democracy before, but has now been turned to an absolute monarchy. And well, Castile is also a monarchy, but I'm not sure if they're gonna stay as a great power. We shall see. Anyway, um, so we'll go forward a little bit. I, I guess what we have to do is basically bring up bring all of our troops home um now i think actually you know what we'll do we'll do immediately we'll demobilize yes we'll demobilize immediately so just so that we know what we are actually working with um i think i'm gonna send you guys here that's fine we have a lot of forces here that we don't actually yeah necessarily need right now and then um i'm gonna have to hunt have you put on hunt rebels Okay, the Spalumbus is still doing their job. Very, very nice. And you guys, just go to Djibouti. I wasn't... I'm not entirely sure where you're going anyways. So, I, I, I suppose... 
I'll just send you here because I have no clue where you're going. Okay, and then, you know what? I'll put all of you on hunt rebels. Just just because we need to deal with the rebels still. Uh, there's 40... Whoa, there's a lot of troops here. Now, that is basically just planes and there's one hussar. We'll leave them here for now. There's not much I can do. Um, our transports can stay in Rome. I think that's fine. And then the rest of our forces will leave here as well. And we can go ahead and check out our budget. We definitely need to reduce our naval spending. That's going to save a lot of money. And then, yeah, we'll have to see if our economy recovers from that. Because, yeah, I mean, we still have a lot of money in the treasury. But obviously, this war has taken its toll on our economy just as, as much. Okay, I think I'm going to... Yeah, decline both of these alliances. We don't need them necessarily. So, yeah. All, all the people are re-demobilizing. Very nice. And Air entered a military alliance with Castile, which is perfectly fine. Awesome. So, I know that was... Yeah, that was... I mean, it's a little bit of a longer episode today, but that's okay. We had a long wait. So, we're going to still have to finish up these people. And, oh, Bavaria wants an alliance. Uh, I feel like we have marriage ties to them. You know what? I'm going to accept that, actually. Because, yeah. I mean, they're now an absolute monarchy. So I don't see why we shouldn't accept their alliance. They no longer have cores. Uh, that's one thing I definitely want to show. They have, obviously, they had cores on the lands, but I've removed them all. So there's no reason to be mad at us. And we basically sort of released them from Germany. Mm, well, they're, they're the German, they're the actual successor state to Germany, really. Uh, that's, they're basically what's left of their legacy. Anyway, uh, I think I'm just rambling on at this point. Uh, one thing... Oh, there's actually one thing I wanted to do. Just when I had a look at all the things in the world, I also checked out the greatest cities. And I've completely oblivious to the fact... Um, I've always... Oh, I've always mentioned as Krakow as being the biggest city in the world. Completely, completely oblivious to the fact that there are way bigger cities in the world. So if you have a look at the population density... And this might still me be me being wrong here but i think the biggest city in the world is actually albany with a population of 1.6 million this is held by the fascists of huron this is native americans uh, iroquois who are fascists they have no other province this is all they have but they have the greatest city in the world that is kind of cool i don't know how yeah but like what it's fantastic. They have 12% Germans here, 10% Eastern Algonquin, and, like, they have only one culture. They have only their primary culture, nothing else they accept. Um, so, this is really strange. Like, they're fascists. Wouldn't you think they would kick them out? It's really hard to tell. This is a really interesting country, but, you know, they can definitely be very powerful if they ever build an economy. Because 1.6 million, I mean, that's... I think that might be more than the Cherokee have. Actually, no, the Cherokee have 4 million. Holy shit. Okay, never mind. But that's more than Sweden has, certainly. Yeah, Sweden has almost nobody. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to show you this. Then there is also Cologne, which is really, really big. Um, where is it? There it is, Cologne, with 1.36 million people. Then we've got Munich with 1.28 million. Then we've got Krakow. So Krakow is only the fourth biggest city with... Uh, yeah, in the world. Um, so I was completely wrong with that. Perhaps it also changed. It could it could be as well. Um, then uh, the next, the fifth greatest city is... Um, I gotta find this one here. Um, nope, please. Population density. Um, I think that was right here. Spukani, which is just under a million people with 940,000. Pretty impressive as well. I think that is... It's not even the capital of the Blackfoot, but obviously this explains why the Blackfoot are... Uh, considered a great power because they have quite a high population as well and then just the sixth greatest power as uh, the sixth largest city i just want to mention because this is actually our largest city uh, it's not rome it's not byzantium it is actually klagenfurt right here with uh um how many nine hundred thousand people this is our biggest city and the sixth largest city in the world just wanted to give you that update because i personally find that interesting anyway um if you have any questions suggestions what uh whatever leave me uh, let me know in the comment section um the way this series is going to continue now um i will probably i mean 
we're actually in a really good position right now to uh, port this over to Hotsvine 4. I have done a test already and it looked really, really good. I got to tell you, it looked really, really good. Um, so what I might do is I might just continue this um, on my own if there's no big wars happening anymore. And then we'll just port that over and the next thing uh, you will see of the series will be in Hearts of Iron 4. But that might not be the case. We'll have to see. It really depends on how this develops. Anyways, I've, I've I'm rambling on. So I'm just going to put a cut in here. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed. And yeah, I'll see you guys next time.